in this class we're going to talk about we're going to finish the last section in in uh, science communication that if you remember we we're talking about the different type of articles and uh, the type of article that you have to write then we will move into tissue crowding beyond cancer so what other applications can have this process and um, to that i'm going to show you that in many cases, viruses, bacteria, some different pathogens can uh, use tissue crowding as a way to get inside of the body. Yeah. So, so although this process we have been talking in terms mainly of cancer, it can be used for diseases, and we are going to talk a little bit about the different type of tumors. The, sorry, a different type of cancers, and um, the sometimes you have rare cancers, and we're going to talk a little bit about rare diseases and how studying cancer or start rare disease is always important because it can help they can help each other to understand better the mechanisms later we will talk about the different cell dynamics and i don't think that we will have time to talk about ctc's if not we will cover it next class um, so uh, here in blue you see the legs of the flies in green you will see tumors yeah so and what you see is there is a lot of things happening there. So I create this movie and the big idea is that there are so many things happen at, at the same time. And we will cover all the different dynamics that happen during development while cancer develops. Okay. And, uh, and if you see, you see things that are moving inside of the legs. Yeah. And outside of the legs that are, yeah, there are so many things happening. So we're going to move, talk about all these ideas of how the tumors travel from one region to another one, and we are going to use as a system the, the fruit flies. Okay, so now let's start with the science communication and how science works. Um, sorry if uh, you had problems or uh, or, or sorry for all my problems last time. Yeah, I don't know what happened with my computer. Sometimes it seems that there are gremlins or my cat is the IT support. And there is always, you know, a, a small problem there. But last time there were too many at the same time. So I apologize for that. Hopefully this time there is no problems. So last time we were talking about that there are different type of articles. And, and we have been talking that... Um, you will have to work on this ones in a miniature uh, articles yeah that is the micro publication that allow you to publish something of a small story instead of throwing that to the garbage or waiting for years until it's finished uh, that is what happened to many of the uh, a lot of the research so we you're going some of you will be writing micro publications uh, yeah and other ones all others of you you will be writing uh, a literature review and we are going to submit some of them to the undergraduate research journal so that hopefully uh, is very useful for your career uh, another thing that I, we talked last time is that, that that we have a problem with science communication different from the, the different type of journals many people consume science in different ways tv social media even pamphlets and again these have all of these one have a peer review process. So peer review process. Uh, while these one are on the blogs and all those things, generally they don't have a peer review process, so you can write anything here. And so there is some attention here. And I'm going to finish this science communication with again uh, a, a video of John Oliver that is short clip that I edit for you that cover again the same problem that we have been talking during all the class. Science, the thing we love and respect so much, we only allow scientists to be portrayed by the likes of Arnold Schwarzenegger, Nicolas Cage and Al Pacino. That <laughs> is how much we respect them and the complexity of the work they do. Science is constantly producing new studies, as you would know if you've ever watched TV. 
A new study shows how sugar might fuel the growth of cancer. A new study shows late night snacking could damage the part of your brain that creates and stores memories. A new study finds pizza is the most addictive food in America. A new study suggests hugging your dog is bad for your dog. A new study showing that drinking a glass of red wine is just as good as spending an hour at the gym. What? That, that last one? No, no, no! That, that last one doesn't even sound like science. It's more like something your sassy aunt would wear on a t-shirt. <laughs> Time.com once even ran the headline, scientists say smelling farts might prevent cancer. It turns out the study never mentioned either of those things. It just pointed out that certain sulfide compounds are useful pharmacological tools to study mitochondrial dysfunction. And while that time story was later heavily corrected, the scientists told us that we still get phone calls and emails from strange radio and TV shows wanting us to talk about farts. Which is clearly a waste of their time. There are now so many studies being thrown around, they can seem to contradict one another. In just the last few months, we've seen studies about coffee that claim it may reverse the effects of liver damage, uh, help prevent colon cancer, decrease the risk of uh, endometrial cancer, and increase the risk of miscarriage. Okay, so I think this is um, a great way to put all the information that we have been talking about and to know that we need to find ways to communicate to the public much better. Okay, so uh, now going back into the scientific process, so we last time I told you that um, maybe sometimes the public is not aware that there is something called peer review process, and, and we talked that there were imprinted and uh, online journals that are becoming very popular, and uh, there are different steps to get the paper accepted, and uh, it requires sometimes months or years to get a paper accepted, and we're experts. Uh, read your paper and give you uh, suggestions or in many times additional experiments. Yeah, so so this is something that is important, and this wide review peer review journals are are uh, are better than pamphlets or on any other information because you are not writing your opinion; you are collaborating in your field to to make a better science. And uh, Again, there, there will be different type of uh, publications depending on your field. And last time I talked about clinical examples. Uh, uh, and, and there is just, depending on your specific field, uh, you will hear about things that I am not gonna go go beyond this class. Um, maybe one day you will explain me or new type of publication that, that will appear or that you are publishing there. Um, Okay, so last time I told you that there are many types of research paper. 
that this is something that you might find in different fields. So we talk about that in addition to the literature review, that is the common one. Yeah, you have other ones that have a criteria of uh, to to specify the specific the, to to determine the specific data. Yeah, so you are doing a review of so reviews, and you also have the one that is the meta analysis that include a uh, statistical methods. And here you have all the information. I'm not going to repeat all the information of the last class, but just to remind you. Finally, we talk about that most of the journals have this uh, organization that it goes introduction, methods, results, discussion, and conclusions. Okay, so uh, even although nature and science don't have it, most of the journals that you will see will have this, this organization that it, you go again from the general to and finish with something very general. So how this apply to so many things and and they at the end the implication of all your work and only a specialist will understand results and methods okay so and finally at the end of the class i told you you know go to moodle and in the, here if you're going to write a micro publication here you find information that it will be useful for you for writing your paper and the same thing for your if you're writing a literature review, here there are the guidelines, and of course here you will find some examples. Okay, so again I told you always the same thing. Here you will find the examples of there, and and this can help you. And I show you that each one of these uh, type of journals of publication have different um, type of figures. So here you have only one figure here. In the literature review, depending on the journal, depending on, on, on the paper, they could be different amount of figures. Uh, the methods are very different too, so go and give a look to that. And please uh, also check the reference, yeah, the amount of reference that you're required to have in each one. Remember that literature reviews require much more papers than a research paper. Uh, okay, so now i show you all this information about uh, I, I quickly review the different type of papers that we are going to write two type of papers a literature review as well as uh, all others all uh, some of you will continue working on a micro publication and here the key information that i wanted to tell you is that i have been always talking about the good things about science now i'm going to tell you that science or the scientific method that we are working, the scientific process also is biased and is not perfect. So I'm going to show you um, during the following classes, things that we need to improve. And I show you the first one uh, that many times, uh, for example, the micro publications, we need them, why? Because sometimes to have these long storage are very complicated and, and you end up wasting a lot of money and most of the data is nobody use it or nobody nobody is going to publish that yeah uh, here the way that you get funding so here to survive in academia you need to get money and large lab are always looking for grants and those that grants come from publishing amazing papers and so nobody will spend time on telling somebody you know that you remember that amazing paper it had a small problem here or this is or look look my results there is a false uh, uh i didn't good 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 results because there was a problem in the experiments that everybody can uh can uh, that most of the people can have so be very careful with this those people those papers are going to get very tiny money or no money. So large universities don't work on that. So this is something that we, start, we have to improve. And in the following video, again, I'm going to show you from the same video clip uh, of John Oliver, I'm going to show you that it also happened a lot, that is p-hacking. Yeah, that he will explain it to you. And for the people that, that, uh, that, uh, have haven't taken statistics you know the p-value you show that something is significantly different and is it made the paper better you know that you say like okay it's, it's 
smoking um this is smoking uh causing cancer so you need to have a significantly value yeah significantly different uh value comparing the normal people with the people that have smoked 20 years yeah and this makes the experiment much stronger however uh, you can also play with the results a little bit to get the value that you expect and it's something that again is not good but if you want to get this amount of money uh, the the funding agencies is, is promoting sometimes that these things happen so again science great but this also i want to show you there are some problems and that we need still need to work okay so now i'm going to show you another video clip that i edit scientists from under John constant Oliver, pressure that i think it summarized very well this funding is. on the line and to get published, it helps to have results that seem new and striking. Because scientists know nobody is publishing a study that says nothing up with acai berries. <laughs> and to get those results, there are all sorts of ways that, consciously or not, you can tweak your study. You could alter how long it lasts, uh, or make your random sample too small to be reliable, or engage in something that scientists call p-hacking. <laughs> it's very complicated. But it basically means collecting lots of variables and then playing with your data until you find something that counts as statistically significant but is probably meaningless. Uh, for example, the website 538 uh, surveyed 54 people and collected over a thousand variables and through p-hacking the results was able to find statistically significant correlations between eating cabbage and having an innie belly button, <laughs> drinking iced tea and believing Crash didn't deserve to win Best Picture, <laughs> and eating raw tomatoes and Judaism. And if you think I'm exaggerating about the impact that this misreporting can have on our faith in science, look at an example from some of the people most guilty of it. Because the Today Show, which lives for scientific studies, recently concluded one segment like this. Like a lot of yeah. studies that we love around here, there have been a couple, especially related to women, right. about the benefits as I get all yeah. serious on yeah. whole milk. Okay, no, whole milk, but it's yeah. true. Well, there's a lot of research, though, that says actually having whole milk mm -hmm. or having whole fat yeah. dairy products actually can yeah. help you lose weight. I think the, the way to live your life is you find the study that sounds best that to you, you. Yeah. and you go with that. No! No, 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 no! Okay, I hope that you enjoyed. Uh, if you really enjoy John Oliver, please, you, I'm going to post the video. Uh, it's uh, in YouTube. It's completely is available. The 20 minutes episode, highly recommended. He explained very well uh, so many problems that we have now with science, with repetition of the studies, with a lot of things that are still happening. And I think if you want to um, study medicine or this could be something that it could be very useful for you. Or in addition, if you want to go to grad school, I think it, to knowing all those things, it can give you a better perspective of what you're, of what you're going to find and what you're going to expect of 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 scientific research. Okay, so I will put that on on as I said on on Moodle in case that you wanted to watch the entire video that I cannot play the entire video here. Now that we talk about a scientific communication and the problems that we have to communicate to the public and also that the scientific process uh, currently is not perfect has improved a lot um, but still we need to keep improving some areas uh, now we're going to talk about one of those areas of improvement and uh, we're going to talk about in this case we have been talking about tissue crowding and we are going to and we have been talking in terms of cancer and and i'm going to show you that there are many cancers that are very common but there are more that are very rare and they are very poorly studied and this is not on this not only happening in cancer happening in all diseases so we have that there are very rare diseases yeah that happen in very that are happening very infrequently but there are so many, but the pharmaceutical companies or the people is not interested in studying those because it, it's not going to produce as much benefit and as studying other ones, that that the, there is a problem there, yeah? So I'm going to talk about that, rare diseases, and then I'm going to move into how 
that in cell extrusion can help us. This phenomena of cell extrusion can help us understand our diseases, and studying rare diseases can also, there, there is a feedback, you know. So studying rare diseases or cancer can help each other to understand better the other mechanisms yeah, of the other diseases. Okay, so I'm going to, again, start showing you a couple videos and then explaining a few things. And then I will move into the particular paper that uh, that it was posted on Moodle. Okay, so let's start. So this is a diagram that show cancer mortality. And here you see it, uh, although cancer mortality in long, uh, uh, in lung cancer represent is, is very common represent 31 percent uh, prostate represent 10 percent colorectal cancer represent eight uh, percent here uh, pancreatic cancer is much less frequent and you can go through all of them and you get a smaller and a smaller amount however if you see 24 percent are other type of cancer so here you will have such a tiny amounts of you know subgroups of type of cancer but when you summer when you unite you combine all those type of cancer they are they are one of the most common type of cancer yeah and here you will have a, a problem because so there is a lot of funding for this one there will be a lot of funding for this one however to study one type of cancer that affect only zero point uh, zero 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 of the population is less likely to get funded and it's very like unlikely to uh to even to find a doctor you know that work on that or uh and we will talk about some of those problems so cancer mortality not all the cancer happen at the same rate and although there are many cancers that happen very rarely when you combine all of those ones we have uh, that rare cancers are, are a big problem because uh, because there are too many that nobody is studying. Okay, so this happened in men, but also if you study women, something similar happened. Again, lung cancer, breast cancer here, also common, colorectal, very similar uh, to what we saw in the previous uh slide and here you find a reduction but look 25 percent yeah the second more popular are the ones that the other the small the very rare amount uh, type of cancer okay so here i am in this slide i just want to show you two key points that uh, every year in the united states uh, there are around there are fewer than forty thousand of uh, rare cancer that represent around 25 percent of all the cell death as i showed in the previous slide so again this is uh, isolated each one of these cancers is not important but when you combine them it's a big problem here uh, uh, what scientists patients and doctors have in common is that these type of cancers uh, they represent a problem for all of them why because uh, as i said before when a patient find that it has a problem and they start getting diagnosed yeah they start finding the the person that tell them you know the problem that you have is this and this is a it's a very rare type of cancer it takes a lot of time and as it take a lot of time the patient lose very valuable time to get uh, healthy yeah so again this is a problem that both patients and and, uh, and doctors have and also um, scientists also have problems as i said to you because there is less funding for the type of of, of research that again they will be uh, very valuable if they are combined and there are many uh, government agents and now they are trying to focus on try to study not only rare cancers but rare disease that this is the the topic that we're going to talk in the next section so in the same way that i told you about rare cancer so i told you that there are uh, more than 100 type of cancers yeah some people can add more than 200 yeah but the idea is that 
when you, the same something similar happened with rare diseases yeah that uh, although we have common diseases that we all have here that is much higher number of diseases that we have in here that are very frequent that are unfrequent to most of the population and for the reason they are very difficult to cure so uh, how do you define what is a rare disease so in the u.s a, a rare disease is defined as a condition that, that affect fewer than 200,000 people or one in in as a thousand six hundred fifty people and that based on the population of the world this will be around a three hundred thirty million people so again there is a lot of people involved uh, suffering from this, these diseases from these rare diseases but uh, again they are just uh, it's difficult to pay attention to 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 those diseases because uh they don't occur frequently in the population so if you remember i told you there were more than 100 that maybe 200 type of cancers rare diseases that are more than 7000 rare diseases and what right now I think is that many of them can be due to a faulty gene yeah this is again we need to study more those diseases but gene therapy could be a game changer for this type of diseases but we need to study those in more detail to know if this is completely true. Okay, so similar to the uh, slides that I show you about cancer with rare disease, something similar happened. This is the percentage of uh, American diagnosed with different diseases. So look, cancer is here. Uh, is a, has a, the in this slide the third, the th uh, the fourth one more common, yeah. The first one more common will be heart disease, then diabetes, and this one, they are just so small and unfrequent, yeah? However, when you combine all of these ones together, if you add all the 7,000 diseases together, this become, uh, this will be number two, sorry, here this was, so this one will move to number three. Okay, so if you see exactly the same problem and exactly in, uh, the same consequence for uh, studying this and for the patient and doctor interactions. Okay, so now I'm going to show you a video of uh, somebody, a doctor that studied rare diseases and that he explained in more detail why studying these diseases is important. Each rare disease by definition is rare, but in aggregate, all of these diseases added up affect large numbers of patients. So obviously understanding what causes these diseases, developing interventions that we can use to treat, prevent the consequences of severe disease affects all of those individual patients. But the lessons we learn from studying rare disease also have huge impact on more common diseases as well by understanding the biochemistry, the molecular basis, the way the genes and pathways interact with each other. So there are many reasons why we want to focus on rare diseases, help all those who have those illnesses and learn from those illnesses about more common disease. To learn more about rare diseases, visit this FDA website.
Okay, so uh, again, this guy worked on those type of diseases. Uh, so he want to get funding to those kind of diseases. Yeah, that more people study and the people from cancer is going to try to get funded to study cancer and said the opposite things, you know, say like cancer, studying cancer can help to understand rare diseases mm -hmm. because we already have established uh, 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 several techniques, several methodology to study that. So again, what I wanted to show you is, uh, again, funding is always going to be... Um, struggle yeah. so here you have that uh, cancer receive a lot of money yeah is one of the diseases that have more more money although we have not uh, solved the problem yeah but as i said if you remember there are more there are more than a hundred diseases yeah at least here heart diseases they receive a lot of funding taking into account that is only one disease but definitely there has been an improvement over the decades diabetes they also receive a lot of money but definitely we have a problem with obesity that is will continue increasing and and although some people said that diabetes will be controlled as a disease in the future uh, and here you see the other diseases yeah and when you study them isolated there is not a lot of funding, but when you study them combined, all rare diseases get a lot of funding. However, remember that this is more than 70,000 uh, yeah, diseases. So in reality, there is, a, there is very little funding for those kind of things. And again, um, this is uh, funding agencies are trying to solve this problem and actually uh, you find many cases that um, funding say agencies are trying to recruit scientists and say like you know we have this new grant that talk about these rare diseases look into that so scientists can switch and say like you know finding finding funding for this thing for cancer is just almost impossible maybe I can try to do both, you know, or and get into these two fields, or and if I get if I get more money here, I switch completely because this is where I can make experiments, and this is what funding funding agencies are are trying to do. Okay, so hopefully this was clear. This is a, a, a very interesting problem that we have right now, and hopefully in the future we have a way to improve it and maybe you will be one and your generation will be the one that can uh, solve this problem with all these rare diseases and definitely new technology will help us a lot uh, to solve those diseases okay now i'm going to show you going to change a little bit and i'm going to talk about go back into crowding yeah and extrusion so in the previous slides what i was showing you is you know there are so many rare diseases and, and there are rare type of cancers and studying those rare diseases can help us understand cancer. So here in this paper, what they did is saying, look, we have been studying extrusion and crowding, but this is not only important for cancer, it can be also important to study our pathology. So remember, rare diseases, studying rare diseases, or on a study cancer, you know, just put cancer here. Uh, studying one can help the other one, and the studying the other one can help uh, rare disease. Studying rare disease can also help can study cancer. So the idea is that we have to give money to everybody, to good researchers that can solve the problems. So let's see how they what they um, talk in this review, very quick. So first thing that they said. And this review is exactly what we talked in the previous classes. Why? Because nobody, not everybody have heard about this topic. So they, they did a, a very quick review about the difference between apoptotic and live cell extrusion. And I'm sure that you already, last time we talked about this uh, S1P, this lipids and the mm -hmm. receptor that it leads to cell extrusion. And we talked that during live cell extrusion, you find a similar mechanism that 
uh, and if you remember, we have this type of cell death that the cells don't have more their house, you know, remember Oikos' house, so the idea that they are not anymore in the epithelia. They are outside of the epithelia in the lumen, and this is how they die. So they were talking about that, and they were talking about how this cell died, and then the actomyosin cytoskeleton uh, and their neighbors are interacting to remove the cell. And in the life cell extrusion, you also find this actomyosin uh, um, band that help the cell to be extruded, although in this case it's alive. So now, uh, based on that mechanism, what they are going to want, what they want to do is let's go forward and let's talk about something more than cancer. And if you watch the video, you see that they talk about different and uh, how it can help to understand asthma and other respiratory diseases. Here, and in this paper, they talk about more invasion of pathogens, okay? So here, in this schematic, what we are showing you is the classical epithelia. So here you see the epithelia, all the cells that we have been discussing, and here you see a slight difference. This is not a monolayer. This, you have uh, uh, two layers of cells, and here the key is that you can have viruses that want to get inside, bacteria, allergen, yeah, different things, uh, different type of pathogens that can affect. And you have also in the side of the body different cells that are trying to protect the organism. And in between that, you have the epithelia, yeah, that the epithelia work as a barrier. So in this paper, they are trying to show how the, the different mechanisms in which uh, pathogens can hijack the process of cell extrusion that we have been discussing to try to infect and colonize the tissue. And they are mainly trying to tell you, you know, remember all the things that we have been talking related to cancer? This uh, can be also important to study other things and it can be useful to study infections. Okay, so all the things that we talk about that it seems that only it was important for cancer can also be important for other mechanisms. So in this paper, they talk about three main diseases here. Um, uh, the idea of studying three diseases is that, or three types of diseases that they show different mechanisms of how the infection take place. Okay, so they, the pathogens are going to take over the, the epithelia and they are going to use different strategies. So here you have the uh, LM, this type of the salmonella, the E. coli, the specific type of E. coli, and a virus from the res uh, respiratory syncytial. Okay, so we're going to talk about this three in detail. There is no need that you understand right now all these mechanisms. I'm just going to show it to you each one by uh, in the following sense, light separated, so you understand in more detail. Okay, so if you want, you can stop the video here and you can think about what is the mechanism uh, of this bacteria to hijack the process of extrusion. Just one uh, key thing, this in blue, is the bacteria and here you have the two proteins that allow it to attach it to to the mechanism of cell extrusion so here you can find it. okay so if you want to stop the video give it a look and later i will go and explain it okay so first thing that i have to tell you is that when a cell is going to extrude because there is cell dead or there is a, or the there is epithel, the epithelia is going to extrude a, a life. So what is going to happen is that you need, in addition to form this actin cytoskel, uh, the actin myosin band that is going to squeeze the cells, you need to deattach the cells. So you need to uh, take all the adhesion molecules that are found here, yeah, in the subapical region. You need to take them and remove them yeah so you what you will need to do is to put it inside and how do you do that by a uh, the process of endocytosis so you take vesicles yeah so here you see an example of vesicles 
that are going and they are trying to remove the the adhesion molecules outside of the cell yeah so they are recycled and uh, and the cells as you start reducing the adhesion the cell is start deattaching okay so this is a very important process that happened here so so let me delete this very quick okay so the other thing that is happening there is that uh, if you see the bacteria it has a specific proteins yeah that attach specifically to the e-coherent or this cmath protein and those ones are fundamental uh, for the cell to, for the bacteria to get inside of the cell and, and infect the cell how they do it so you have this the proteins of the bacteria that are represented here by the circle and the triangle they are the lnn la and lnn b and those one will attach as i said with the e-coherent and with other protein that is called the cmet those are proteins that are involved in the adhesion in this case and generally they uh, there's the cells to extrude they need to remove the uh, the using endocytosis to remove the junctions and as a result of that the uh, the e coherent bounds to the lm and it allows to the internalization into the host so if you see here see here they are here they are attached and now they can go inside of the other cell and this is how they the process of cell extrusion can be used can be hijacked to extrude the uh, to sorry to infect the, uh, the epithelium okay so this is one process that they have been described now i'm going to go and explain the second process okay so here you see a completely different mechanism while in the other one we were talking about using the extrusion yeah using the process of the disassemble the adhesion to get inside of, to infect the cells here if you see something different happens so you can stop the video if you want and see what happened question are the cells actually extruding or not here yeah. so here you have the back the bad bacteria here in blue and see what is happening here okay and here again this symbol mean inhibition okay so give it a look you want if you want you can stop the video okay so here you see that the key thing here was this process that here you have a protein that is attaching to the bottom of the cell yeah and here in the bottom there is a protein that is attached to the integrins yeah so in other words the bacteria is sending a protein that is affecting the focal adhesion yeah and it's stabilizing the cells so the cells now they don't extrude and the bacteria can start invading other other tissue so by so the cell is generally was going to extrude because it's sick now it's not going to extrude because the bacteria they use it as a way to go and invade other cells but taking over of the process of the of the extrusion via the integrins we are the focal adhesion so let me show you what they talk in the paper so you have these three types of uh, uh, diseases that show uh, a different mechanism like salmonella and here uh, e coli and they inhibit extrusion by delivering this protein that is the o ospe or their homologous into the host cell and here this bind to the integrin and the linking uh, kinase here that you can see in gray so this is what you see so this is the the bacteria protein and here you see the this is the host proteins that are interacting and these allow one thing that is stabilize the focal adhesions when you stabilize the focal adhesions it increases the adhesion to the cell matrix and it in inhibit cell extrusion so here if you remember this symbol here these two mean inhibiting and in that way they uh, 
or active or block the pathways of cell extrusion to make it more susceptible for, for invasion. Okay, so here I show you in this schematic what I show you is that they block the process of extrusion to make it more susceptible to invasion. Okay, so first mechanism using uh, taking advantage of endocytosis to invade. Second mechanism is taking, taking the focal adhesion to, uh, to modify the extrusion, yeah, to modify the apoptosis to be able to invade uh, the, the tissue. Okay, so now we get into the last mechanism. And in this mechanism, we are talking about uh, a virus, yeah? And in this virus, what you have here is that the virus is producing a protein that is going to inhibit the immune response. And it's, as it's inhibiting the immune response, the cell is not able to attack the virus. So you have many, many virus. And in particular, this F protein in the virus is going to interact with its uh, P53 and is going to lead to apoptosis. So what is going to happen? You have a cell that have many virus uh, that have many viruses that are going to be released and is going to infect other uh, other cells there around there. So what you're going to have is a blockage uh, in uh, the uh, different structures of, of the respiratory system, thanks to the excess on cell extrusion, that it will lead the more cell extrusion, the more virus infections that you will have. Okay, so uh, in case that you didn't read the paper, remember you have this disease, RSV, that means respiratory syncytial virus, that has a protein that is the MS2 that I just show you here. So let me, this protein in blue, and I told you that, that protein is interacting, is suppressing the antivirus response, yeah? And uh, that the RSV uh, fuse, uh, the fusion protein F that you can see here, yeah, is going to interact with the P53 uh, uh, dependent apoptosis in the epithelium. And as a result of that, you're going to have more cells that are going to die, and this will end up producing air obstruction. You're going to have more inflammation, uh, and it will lead to the uh, acceleration of extrusion of apoptotic cells. Okay, so let me show you a little bit in more detail what happened in, in a human when the virus attack. Okay, so finally, here you have the respiratory system with all the different structures. And here what uh, what happens is if the virus get clears out, you don't have so much uh, extrusion. However, if there is a lot of extrusion, you are going to start blocking the different uh, respiratory systems and you can have different diseases. So the airways are very important and are connected. The blockage depends on how, may, how the infection is taking over uh, and leading to apoptosis in, in different regions so, of the tissue. And if you watch the video, do you watch the video lecture? She talk in more detail about some this type of things. Okay, so we finished this section. So in the beginning of the class, we talk about uh, the peer review process, the process of science communication. We talk about the different papers, the good and the bad things of the of our current scientific method and how science is is is. Uh, um, is produced right now. And then we move into uh, rare diseases, that rare diseases that you have tumors, that you have rare, different rare cancers, and that you also have rare diseases. And I show you in particular that there's an interaction between studying rare diseases and studying common diseases, and that is studying studying each one of uh, if you study common diseases it can help to study rare diseases and studying rare resistance can also understand the mechanisms to study the other type so so in particular i show you for example with tissue crowding that it can help us to understand better uh, bacterial and virus infection yeah and i show you three different mechanisms that are described in the paper um, now we are going to talk about we're going to start moving more into your research projects that you have talk in the in the that you have um, 
developed in the last few years. And I'm going to start talking about that by talking about cell dynamics of tumors. And, uh, and I'm going to show you a few movies during this process. So now I'm going to talk about the advantages and disadvantages to work with uh, pupae in fruit flies to study morphogenesis and to understand <coughs> uh, metastasis. So pupae is a great system to study to image cancer. Why? Because different from uh, fish or from mice that you, if you want to see them, to image them, you will have to kill it. Yeah, because they, they need to move. You can try to sleep them for a short time, a short amount of time, but if you do it for a prolonged time, they will end up dying. With the pupae, they are already, like they are already covered by the pupil case and they have very small amount of movement. So to study, this can make a, a good case that the pupae can be a good system to study canalization, eh, sorry, <laughs> colonization so that they one how a tumor can go and travel to another tissue um that is is very difficult so we have studied a lot in detail how this happened how the tumors grow and start invading however this process of how they travel yeah and how they attach into another process in the early stages is very difficult generally what we have is when uh, study when the tumors are very big so we have studied the transition especially when they get big and also we study when they are very big in another part but the cellular process the cell dynamics of what happened how they travel between cells in vivo is 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 much more complicated um, and there are multiple limitations to study that yeah in particular there is something called traveling tumors yeah the ctc's so this last section is particularly difficult. And I'm going to show you what some students try to do to study this question. Yeah, and I'm going to show you how they found that from a one tumor, you can start seeing pieces of cells dropping and, 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 and separating from the other tissue. Yeah, and start moving in different direction and later uh, we wanted to test if they can actually attach here. So this, it will be ideal to see if we can do that, if we can see them moving and attaching to an other tissue. And I'm going to show you that so far we were able to do this part, to evaluate this part, and this part is more difficult. And when I told you the disadvantage is that uh, we need to find better tools because we were able to image six hours and then there was a, a, a change in the pupae and um, and later we cannot find the tumors anymore yeah it seems that they, the, the the pupae suffered so many changes in in a rapid time that later or the pupae is dead is that or or we cannot find it anymore so let me show you a a little bit about what is happening and 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 show you the, the question. Okay, so here, what you see here is three schematics, the pre-pupil, yeah, the early stages of the pupil stage, then the late pupil, and here you see the adult, the one that you really that you know. And these legs that you see here and the wings that you see here, they early in development they don't look like that they look more something like this or in the very in the pupae pre pupae they look um they look like this very chubby structures so here i'm showing you not in an schematic i'm showing you actually when you go and do confocal microscopy how this tissue look like so here you have the mouth part in green that you can see here in blue you have the first pair of leg the second pair of leg and here you can see a third pair of leg yeah and uh, here you see the wings yeah so uh, here you see the wing here you there should be an R wing is uh, 
because of you cannot image you cannot control exactly uh, how to image that you will miss one section or the other one so in this image you cannot see the other wing but it's there and what we did is use uh, genetically produce express RAS B12 you remember that the oncogene and we also use a, a tumor suppressor a scribble and we combine them and what we did is creating tumors in the legs like this one yeah so these are just the schematics of the tumor and later you will see how they start uh, eliminating cells yeah shredding cells and those cells start moving all over here in yellow you see um, a boundary that we that is there the, the tumors don't go beyond that boundary that is like it's covering the the legs and the, those um imaginal disc that that we are describing there okay so just to for as a reminder we have three experimental approaches one is in silico that is the one that we use computers and computer simulation yeah, the second one is the in vitro that we use petri dishes, and the third one that is the in vivo. And uh, there is another one that is in between in vitro and in vivo. There are there are many, but just these are the three general, the more popular. We have something called ex vivo. When you have ex vivo, is that you have you take a sample that is alive, you know, and put it in a petri dish to grow. Yeah, and it can grow for a different amount of time yeah so you put the right food the right things and you can grow for example fruit fly legs fruit fly wings all those things in a pet tradition study that development why because when they are alive um, sometimes you cannot see them sometimes uh, you want to study a uh, put a, a specific a drug a pharmacological treatment and in the leg in the in the organism they are more difficult to study so you can do that and this is called ex vivo and this is what i told you just right now so you can grow a leg in a petri dish so you take one of these tiny structures here all this imaginal disc all these uh, epithelial pockets that are going to divide very fast during development you take your petri dish you open them and you put the flies inside some of you have done something uh, something like this in, in one of the labs i didn't want to push you very hard to do all those things I, it's difficult but uh, people have been very successful in growing this with practice and and keep those legs for 20 for between 12 and 20 hours after pupation. Of course, later they will die. They will have a, a, a normal development for 10 or 20 hours, and then they will end up dying because they don't have all the all the chemical signals of the leg, and, and that's all. But this is how generally uh, people have been studying tumors uh, using fruit flies, and it's, it's, it's very useful, and it has been, uh, it has been, um, a great technique to study okay so that it have and um, help us to develop so it's not completely in vitro it's not completely in, in vivo and it's a good combination uh, however i went and studied all those things completely live yeah so i i tried to okay what about if we study the, this completely live not for 10 hours not for 20 hours but uh, for a much longer time yeah and could we study the early stages of, of cancer transition and i found that there is a great amount of information there yeah so for example i found that there is a lot of behavior so i will show you uh, movies of the tumors that they start breaking into small pieces yeah so you see in green you find this is a movie of a tumor in a fly in the legs and um, you don't see the legs because uh, there i only had gfp in the tumor but you, what you can see is that over time this uh, the tumor start breaking and it start shredding cells also you can find other type of behaviors 
so the cells can also interact uh, and if you see there was a long cable between them this is a protrusion and if you see the tumors start start fusing so again could, is, is this useful to study uh, to study cancer development definitely however the interpretation of the results is more complicated uh, when these were a combination when you use RAS B12 and a tricellular junction and here you have RAS B12 and a scribble and again we found that some cells were able to travel yeah we then found if that they were properly attached and I'm going to show you that there is when RAS and when you study RAS and a scribble this combination you have even more cell behaviors okay so again there was different techniques to study generally it has been a study uh, uh, ex vivo I tried to go full in vivo and see what happened okay so when you study in vivo uh, uh, fruit flies one thing that they have been trying but uh, if the data was not published is to use the brain of the flies yeah in the larval stage so uh, here what you see is the cephalic complex so here is the eyes and the antenna in early stages here you see the brain and here you see the nerve cord ventral nerve curve that you can see here the, here you see the the normal fly yeah the normal ventral nerve cord and here this is what happened when you create the tumor yeah so you put gfp to label the cells and you produce this oncogene and tumor suppressor combine them and what you see is that the tissue looks completely the normal shape yeah and this is a great way to study um a great way to study cancer However, you, if you remember, the larvae are always moving, so you can, you have to anesthetize it and, and study it for 15, 20 minutes, and then the, the pupae can die, so you can do that, and maybe come back in, in an hour or two hours and, anest and take pictures again and try to look for the same spot where, that you were imaging. So it is, it's, it's difficult to image the, the cells like that. So the idea is to see them growing, the tumors, yeah and see in this case on brass and scribble they keep growing and growing until the tissue doesn't lose all, all the things so we were trying to do this okay this is possible to study for a short time in in, in the brain of the flies but about if we do the same thing and we grow tumors and tumors bigger and bigger in the leg and see what are the processes that are happening yeah and we find to my surprise we find a lot of behaviors that take place also in humans so for example we found a structure called cyst not all the tu not all the cysts are tumor not all the tumors are cysts yeah so we found cells that migraines in the legs and you i will show you cells that are moving on top of the legs that they leave the epithelia and they start moving and they have like tiny legs like this and you will see them moving we see that the tumors can start fusing in as i showed you before and here they will fuse like that and i will show you something that <laughs> uh, that i i haven't seen before that is the tumor gets so big that to some at some point they all the legs uh, they just break and you see the tumor travel in there Okay, and the other thing that I will show you is how they migrate into another tissue, but this will be the last section that I will show you. So now I'm going to make a connection and show you that all the things that we study in flies have a connect is how are have an importance to study tumors in humans, yeah, cancer in humans. So first thing that I have to tell you is that when we study when do we study imaging when we use imaging we found that cells are moving yeah and to move they need to keep their cell uh, junctions so they move as a collective group 
and they do that to repair the tissues for morphogenesis and or also during cancer. And here, one that you see this, in one side you will see the normal, no, the, you will see in green the cells that have expressed this RAS and scribble. Here there is no labeling. Here if you see, you have, uh, there is the leg. And here you see with the label, and I want that you pay attention to this. I just put this too, so you you see that you, this is clear for you, more clear to see, at least in the beginning. So what you see is the cells interacting, and if you see they are on the top of the leg, and they start they start moving. So yeah, so here you see those cells moving like that. And to my surprise, this looks exactly what we find in vitro in humans yeah so if you take a tissue yeah you will have a leading cell here and you will have also in addition to the leading cell here you will have a retracting cell here and this is the way that they move yeah so this has been found in in human tissues with in vitro assays the 3D, and this is an oral squamous cell carcinoma, and they uh, show this very interesting the attachment of the of the cells that they move in, in clusters, and they can invade other tissue. So, to me, the surprise is that using fruit flies, you can find things that are very similar to what you have you find in humans. Again, you cannot find this in humans in vivo because it's very difficult to do that. Yeah, and it's not ethical to take somebody and put it in a microscope and, and it will be very difficult uh, to do it. Yeah, but in fruit flies, you can uh, see a lot of similarities. What is to me is very interesting. OK, so now you say, OK, Nicholas, did you only found this in flies and in humans? But there is no other tissue where you can see that, and actually, you see that this type of migration is very common. It can be, it has been found in zebrafish, where you find these uh, leading edge cells that we talked before. And if you remember, we talked about that in the lateral line of their primordium. So that is an important finding. That so in normal development, you also have those things. It's not only about cancer. However, when you work with uh, in humans with uh, these um, cell lines so for example in a mammary cancer genoma you also find these leading cells that are moving collectively okay uh, again even in uh, melanomas you can see the same type of tumor where you have these a uh, 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 leading edge cells and retracting cells that are allowed the cells to move. Okay, so in other words, the, you find that what we found is a similar mechanism that it had been conserved during evolution in vertebrates and in invertebrates, and, uh, and that it can be reused in different types of cancers. Okay, so this is why one of the good things of standard fruit lines life, while well, other, other examples were generally uh, uh, in vitro tissues here we can study that process alive and here you see let me delete this so it's more clear so okay here you see the tip cells yeah that are the ones and you can see them how they form how they start forming these tiny tiny legs yeah, and they start organizing to start becoming into the lineage, and uh, and I can show you the same thing how these retracting cells start attaching and deattaching. Yeah, so and this is a process that uh, this is a project that I need to publish eventually. So if you one one of you are interested in in working on how tumors move in an epi, in a in a in a fruit fly. Uh, there is, I have a lot of work to do there. Anyway, so let's move here. Another, another type of 
cell dynamics that I found there related to cancer is these cystic tumors. And uh, cystic tumors are a closed sac having distinct membrane and division compared to the nearby tissue. So here you have a, an example. So here you have uh, the sac that I was talking that is like a circular barrier. And here you have a different environment. Here there's one environment and here you have another, another environment. Let's put yeah and uh, here inside it could be full of cells or it can be a liquid that yeah, depend on 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 here the the main idea is um is that there is a difference in there's a layers of cell that form these little capsules so you can see for example this is what it has been describing is describing irish rats and this is the cell carcinoma and this is what it has been described in humans. Yeah, and of course, we found something very similar in flies. So no matter how different are flies from, from rats and humans, this is, seems to be something that is conserved during evolution. Okay, so here, I'm going to show you the movie that described that. Okay, let me delete this. So you can see it. Okay. Okay. So. Mm -hmm. And here. So well, in the other samples, what you were seeing, it was just a picture. Here you see how they start forming and the cells are actually moving, and how how these uh, processes are happening. Yeah. So again, you find a lot of processes that are happening when you study grass and uh, scribble, and instead of just having cell proliferation you have a collaboration of different processes that are taking place at the same time that this was not described before uh, another thing that it could happen when you have this uh, when you analyze cell dynamics is this process so uh, it's the same images in the right and the left the difference is that uh, here you only have in the left uh, GFP and in the other one, you have the GFP plus a technique that allow you to see how the leg is developing using just a uh, interference light. And as you can see, the tumor has started creating a, a tiny protrusion that is going to communicate to another tumor. Yeah. So again, tumors don't work alone. They start interacting with each other. And this is a, a phenomenon that we have been studied in a lot of detail in our systems. So what I'm going to show you here, in blue is the leg, as I showed in the beginning, and in green, again, you will see tumors, and you see very big tumors here. You see one that are on the sides of the leg, other ones that are inside of the leg. Yeah, so you will see things that have like a tail. Those are immune cells. Yeah, and you can see, you will see tumors, and you will see immune cells inside. And you will see uh, the trachea, and you will see a lot of behaviors taking place there. Uh, now, I'm going to play the movie, and the idea here is that you see that uh, I, I have been showing you those processes separated by one by one. Yeah. However, what happened when the tumors start growing is that you see all of them taking place at the same time. So it becomes very difficult to study because uh, there's just too many things happen at the same time and you see the tumors interacting in different ways. In other words, uh, I told you that I was going to tell you the good and the bad things of this study, the cell dynamics in fruit flies, and one of them is that, uh, that um, you can go to the, it's difficult to find the two extremes, like, or you do a perturbation that produce, that have no effect, or you can go into a, a genetic perturbation that that it produces such a strong a strong effect that the tumors grow so fast that they are very difficult to study. But definitely there are a lot of behaviors happen. Uh, okay, so 
just to finish you can see here this tumor that grows so much that end up breaking all the all the legs yeah so here again the same idea just when the tissues are not functional anymore they are not interacting with each other they will end up not only damaging the not being functional but in this case they damage the tissue let me play again for you so what you see is like a, a tumor uh, here that slowly they, they start they just break because they are so big and they end up damaging the leg from inside uh, so again to finish this section i show you uh, an example of uh, a tool that it could be very useful in the future that is imaging cancers in fruit flies uh, now in, in not we are not only doing it um setting the beginning or, or the end yeah as i show you in the brain of the fly they use this they show, this is what happened in the beginning this is what happened at the end that the tissue completely invade the that the cancer in, completely invade the, in the brain of the fly what we have found is that um, that although this always happened the way in which this, the tissue invade the cancer invade the, the pupae it seems to be a slightly different every time so so it, it become a little more difficult to study because you cannot have a lot of repetition so you find in some tissues that and they end up breaking or once they have cyst or once they can have some other type of migrations so it, it become the, the topic more interesting but at the same time more difficult to study okay i hope that this was clear and if you have any doubt let me know again there is so much information about this that i have collected that i just need to study it with somebody if you're interested let me know and in the next section i'm going to show you the only example that i was completely sure that it happened every single time so we we report that information and um, i hope that you enjoyed the also the next the next section that of the of the class that it was done mainly by undergrad students a few years ago